Good morning. So every year for the last few years, for the month of February, I use it as the month to talk about love. And I um, thought I'd go somewhere different, but I ended up right back on the topic of love. And so for the next three Sundays, I'm talking about the love challenge. Not the drop challenge, but (laughs) the love challenge. (laughs) So today, the first part of that series is entitled, Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. Can't Take My Eyes Off of You. In the summer of 2009, Deshauna Barber was 19 years old. She was between her freshman and her sophomore year in college, and she was working at a summer position at Target. She was working in the woman's department when she noticed this lady staring at her. This this woman was staring so hard. I don't know if you ever felt that, like when someone's staring so hard, it's hard to kind of ignore them. She finally concluded, this woman probably has a few screws loose. And so she tried to ignore her. But the lady just kept staring at her. And it was not, it was hard for her, she says, to not feel the lady's eyes staring at her. So she goes over to the lady and says, hello, you know, welcome to Target. May I help you find something? And she says, the lady asked her, were you born in this country? When that offended her. And she said, yes, I was born here. And then the lady asked her another question, do you have kids? And she's like, okay, so she wants to stereotype me, no. And then the lady asked her if she was married. And again, she said, no. And then the lady asked her how old she was. And she said, 19, can I help you with something? (laughs) The The lady then responds to her, you are the most beautiful girl I have seen. And then she says, I think you could be the next USA. The lady asked her to meet at Starbucks the next day, and for some reason she agreed, and the next day this lady bought a foot-tall stack of pageant books and proceeded to convince Deshauna that she should enter the state pageant. You have to win see the state pageant before you can go on to win the USA pageant. And so three months later, Deshauna enters into her first pageant state, and she loses. That's okay, because she's not a quitter. She competes her second year at the state, and she loses. She goes back her third year, and she loses. She goes back her fourth year, and she loses. She goes back her fifth year, and she loses. But guess what, you all? She goes back her sixth year, and guess what? She loses. (laughs) Got you, didn't I? And finally, her dad pulls her to the side and says, baby, I love you. And you know, I think you are a diamond. You are everything to me, but you, you got to stop doing this. This thing you're doing, trying out for pageants, you know, it's, 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 it's tearing you apart. We, we can't do this. We've rooted for you every year. Baby, you got to find something else to do with your life, but you got to stop doing this. Deshauna says she was prepared to quit. The reason I share with you Deshauna's story is because it tells us the power of someone seeing something in another human being that they have not seen in themselves. This woman saw such raw beauty in Deshauna, she couldn't take her eyes off of her. She did something we are taught as kids not to do. She stared. She kept looking at Deshauna. And then she stepped outside of her own comfort zone to share with this total stranger how absolutely stunningly beautiful she was. This is where we enter the biblical text that we heard read so wonderfully by Anne Audrain this morning. Jesus saw the boats and the fishermen, not only with his eyes, but Jesus saw it with his mind. Interestingly enough, it does not say he saw men, it doesn't say he saw women or children, but he saw a profession. He saw undeniable beauty in the fisher people. So here is Jesus on the job teaching. At the same time, he's in a boat observing the fishermen. By the way, could you imagine showing up to church on a lake, sitting in a boat? Nice idea for next year, 2022 summer service, right? (laughs) Here is Jesus kicking it with the people right in nature. And while it appears he's doing one thing with the people, Jesus is multitasking because he's also observing Simon. Can't take my eyes off of you. 
Simon doesn't even know he's being watched. So after he finishes teaching, he now turns his full attention to Simon and he asked him to direct the boat further into the deep. And Simon's response is, boss man, the fish are not catching. We've been out here all night and nothing. Now, though not a fisher person, I am biologically related to fisher people, and sometimes the fish are just not biting. Simon had already determined this was not the time to go fishing, but it was the time to come in. As subtle as he knew how, he tries to suggest to the non-fishing person, Jesus, this is not the time. However, in the words of Shug in the color purple, God was trying to tell Simon something. I know you know what you're doing, but Simon, I know what I'm doing too. You've underestimated me. I am in the fishing business too, and I have some success fishing for people. I fish for the lost. I fish for the hurting. I fish for the blind. I fish for the person who's been kicked down one too many times. I fish for those who keep being made to pay for the same mistake without little changes of redemption in our society. I fish for those that the world judges hardest. I fish for those at the well and at the bus stop and getting out of prison and running from one pot to another, avoiding border control just to have a chance at this thing called life. I know you know what you're doing, but I was sent from heaven above to fish for people. And just like that, there were more fish than Simon could handle. Imagine being stressed out because you suddenly have too much. Wouldn't that be a nice problem for the church to have too many people? He had to call other fisher people from other boats to come and help him out blowing Simon's mind, amazement and stress infused into one moment. And while Simon was dealing with this situation, Jesus had already seen Simon's beauty. He saw something in Simon that Simon did not see in himself. You see, there are two kinds of people. There are doers and there are those who can just be. The B folks are like Mary. They love to sit at Jesus' feet, love to be present in the moment. They know how to relax. They are the life of the party. They can enter in and journey with you. They make others feel good about themselves. They are good in helping and service industry jobs. People are quick to trust these kind of folks, but then there are the doers, the Marthas, and the Simons of the world. Every church wants the doers as well. They can't sit still. They have to do something. They have to assemble new furniture. They have to dig the snow. They have to clean the whole house. They have to take on some new project. They feel at their best when they are doing something. And Jesus needed some doers for his ministry. He noted folks who could work all day on a boat and not catch anything. People who knew how to sit with disappointment as comfortably as they sat with joy. People who could sit on the water and wait for it. People who knew how to catch a fish and could discern when the fish weren't biting. He could have picked anyone, but he saw the beauty in Simon. And he was like, I have to have that guy on my team. Have you ever had a stranger speak to you and you wondered, because you didn't know them, you wondered if they were talking to you. And so you, you look around, you look to your left and you look to your right to see if maybe they're talking to somebody besides you. You just aren't sure. I imagine that Simon felt that way, like not being able to get away from this woman's stare in Target, being seen by Jesus in the intensity of all those fish after a night of, no, of nothing, Simon says to Jesus, just go. Sometimes just being seen by another person, just being gotten, just having someone understand you and see your beauty is too much. It was especially too much for Simon, just being caught up in the moment. Jesus stargazes and all those fish was just too much for Simon. Something is happening here that we will never perhaps fully understand. Sometimes we are not ready for God. We're not ready for the power of God. We're not ready for God blowing our minds. We just, we just aren't ready. 
Last week, we voted to become an officially LGBTQ church. Y'all supposed to clap. Y'all supposed to be like, woo, 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 woo. We talked about bringing some champagne, but we didn't want to shock you too much. Some said to me, but we already were that. Of course we were. But thanks to Reverend Chin's leadership, we are official because it's important for folks to know that we have done the work not to harm others. There are a whole lot of churches in Chicago, but that list shrinks a lot when we start talking about not just being open, but being affirming of people's race, affirming of their ethnicity, affirming of their religion, even if they aren't Christians or if they're agnostic, affirming of gender and class and sexuality. That list gets small, and it gets smaller when you look for churches that are official. And Reverend Chin is filling out papers right now with each denomination so we can be official. We are official over here that love is love is love is love. And if you can't get with that, there are so many other churches in Chicago where you will feel totally welcome. But at United, we celebrate healthy, good, stick to your bones, loving, and we stay out of people's bedrooms. And we've got a lot of work to do when it comes to seeing the beauty of the trans community. We have a lot of work to do when it comes to seeing the beauty of queer folks. We have a lot of work to do when it comes to seeing the beauty of the bisexual and the lesbian and the gay person and people, when it comes to seeing those who are different as beautiful, so beautiful that we can't take our eyes off of them. Do we have any grandparents out there in YouTube and Facebook land or here? A grandparent is a unique role. Maybe I should say most grandparents, because there's probably somebody that didn't get one of those good grandparents. Most grandparents have a unique role. So let me tell you, I think every kid should have a grandparent because those individuals delight and they see beauty in their grandkids. I listen to some of you. Grandparents have already, they did their mistakes on their kids, right? They did all their mistake on their kids and then when their kids' kids come along, they're like chill. They're a whole different state of being. They don't have anything to prove. And so the rules are very different for their grandkids. They're like, are no rules, actually. So one of my friends, she grew up in a Muslim strict community. She grew up in a poly household and her parents were vegetarians. And so late at night, when she was over her grandmother's house, they would go downstairs to the kitchen and they would open the ice box. You can guess what they would take out and they would take out ice cream. Now my friend wasn't supposed to have ice cream. That was not a part of what she was supposed to have. But grandma would pull out that ice cream and fix them both a bowl and they would eat it and lick the spoon. And you know how sugar tastes when it's cold and it's creamy and it's mixed with milk. And after they got done, her grandmother would lean in and say, Penta, now you can't tell anyone that grandma gave you this ice cream. You see, grandparents are made for breaking the rules. They are like under some spell to have fun and give their grandkids fun. And it includes junk food and the full spectrum. But more than anything, good grandparents have one role, to see the beauty in small creatures. That's it. About six years ago, I don't know if you guys remember, the spotlight came on Ted Williams. Ted Williams was this homeless man, and many drove by him giving him some change, but he was in Ohio, and he had this um, uh, cardboard uh, uh, kind of like square sign, and on it, it said he had a golden voice. Well, most people ignored him, but the news station, somebody from the news station saw him and one day rolled down the window and invited him to share his voice. Now to look at Ted, all you could see was hard times and addiction. You could see the dirt on his face. You could see his hair needed a back cut. And yet on this day, as someone saw him and stopped and allowed to hear his voice, something came through. Ted was beautiful under all of that. His voice really was golden. 
and then he got a haircut and he really looked like a different person. Here's the thing, his beauty, his intelligence, his voice, it always was there. But so was the grime and the hardness of the valley. What if all of God's creation has beauty, but we might have to search a little bit for it because what it looks like up front is nothing. It's sometimes like when you go in the thrift shop, I have a hard time, but some people can go in thrift shops and find beauty. It's not just meeting you at the door, you might have to walk up and down a few aisles, but I wonder if part of love is all about seeing the beauty that the world might overlook. Can't take my eyes off of you, beauty. Anybody can see you when you look good, when you've been to the hairdresser or the barber shop, when you wax, when you're looking good. But when you're dirty and you're stinky and you're struggling and you haven't had your hair cut in a while and you become repulsive to most people. Years ago, a friend of mine was looking for a condo. She had a little money, but she didn't have a whole lot of money. And she looked at several places and when she had finally, finally settled on one place, she called me and said, hey, I'd like you to come and look at this condo with me. Now, when I went to see the condo, I'm telling you, what I saw was a hot mess. But my mature friend saw something else. I saw the condo, and I didn't have a lot of imagination. But my friend saw what the condo could be. Are you guys hearing me? I saw the condo as it was. She saw the condo for what it could be. You see, I can break a hole in the wall here, and then this could be the pathway to a kitchen. I saw what the condo was. She saw what the condo could be. And after time, she hired a renovator to come in and do some work. And then I saw the condo as she saw the condo. God needs some Christians that can see what our church could be, not what it is. It's easy to see the bills. It's easy to see hard time. It's easy to get caught up in the news. But God needs some Christians that will see what the journey could be, that could see what United could be, what it could be. Are you guys catching the vision? A few years back, I met a high school classmate, and you know what she said? I don't know you. You see... Who I was as a teen was depressed. Who I was as a teenager was dealing with parents getting divorced. Who I was back then was dealing with a mom who had a sickness that there was no diagnosis for. Who I was then was a traumatized, angry teenager. I know I can't be the only one that has that testimony. You see, I wasn't nothing much to look at, but God took me and God made me where I am today. You see, if someone had looked at me then, but who we are today, God is always seeing beauty where we don't see much at all. God sees beauty. Jesus said, I didn't come for those who got their sugar, honey, iced tea together. I didn't come for the people that got it all together, but I came for those whose beauty is hidden. I came for those who are messed up on the inside. I came for those who have been judged and buked and scorned because I see you. I see your beauty. I see what you can be, not what you are. I see what you can be. And that's what faith is all about. Simon, I see something you don't see. You just got to trust me. You just got to hold on a little while longer. You just got to stay in the boat. You just got to go out a little bit further. You just got to push your way into the deep. You just got to let the net fall right here. You just got to believe me on this one because I see what you could be. That's what faith is all about. Drop the net. Today, I began with Deshauna's story. She was in college and in ROTC when this lady approached her. She had gone through school being bullied and called skinny and called dark. She remembers one bully that she would try to avoid because that bully made her life hell, contributed to what she says was low self-esteem. She had never, ever seen herself entering a pageant, much less being beautiful. She was on a path and someone, a complete Stranger, maybe what I like to think a messenger from God, saw beauty in her that she did not see in herself. 
And because a stranger saw something in her she didn't see in herself, she decided to enter a pageant. And after six losses, you heard me, six losses, six years of trying straight in a row, she was angry. This lady had messed up her life. And she goes to tell the lady off. And two months before her seventh pageant, she calls Leslie, but she can't get Leslie. She goes on Leslie's Facebook page and she sees all these rest in peace. No one knew to tell her because no one knew about her. Leslie died fighting leukemia. And she discovers, man, my cheerleader, my cheerleader, I'm gonna do this pageant one last time for Leslie. And two months later, she wins the District of Columbia pageant. Six months later, Dejana wins Miss USA. God doesn't call us to see what is obvious and right in front of our eyes, but God calls us to see what isn't. Calls us to see beauty where others might overlook. Calls us to see beauty in our young ones and our old ones. Calls us to see beauty in every creation, no matter the gender, the cognitive, the smell, their sexuality, their race, ethnicity. God calls us to see what God sees. God calls us to see with our faith. I can't take my, I can't take my eyes off you. Can't take my eyes off of you. Seeing what God sees can't take my eyes off of you. Amen and amen.